Murray. And today we have a special meeting. We have a few um, guests, including Mr. David Kanepa. He's being a big supportive of our efforts. <laughs> 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 He's going to give us a few updates on a couple issues of housing and our efforts to establish a co-op here in the park. Um, we believe it's extremely important for all the residents to participate in this effort because everything that is being done here is to save your home. So you guys can live here for a long, long time. Uh, they will see the health of the house that the issue and they issue the bombs on behalf of the residents and for the protection of the residents. Um, after that issue of the bomb, the part should have been transferred to the residents. It has been about 18 years and we are working on that process and we, we are getting very close now. With the co-op moving forward, we are almost there. But we need the participation of everyone that has not signed up yet for the co-op. And we invite you to ask questions. We have two attorneys here present. If you have specific questions, please ask the attorneys. They can give you the, a very accurate information as far as what's going on with the co-op. I know some of you question what do those songs mean up there by the front. Well, some of them are designed to confuse you and to give you the wrong information. Okay. Why are those signs out there? I'll leave that up to you. But the attorneys are here to clear any of those questions that you might have. So please, I encourage you to use them and their knowledge. Okay? If you have questions, about anything, they're here to answer those questions. Without any delay, we're going to introduce me, Mr. David Kaneva, which so kindly to come in a Sunday afternoon and share some of his time with you. Well, good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I was asked to talk about a, a couple issues, so I wanted to sort of explain uh, what we're doing around housing um, in San Mateo County. Uh, but let me just thank the leadership here uh, for all the work um, that you do. You know, getting people on board, like you said, it's about providing uh, information that's transparent, um, information that's correct. And it's good that you have uh, lawyers, I saw Shelly here, um, earlier to really sort of explain what exactly is happening. I think that's important because there's a legal basis uh, for that. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about what's happening uh, in San Mateo County around housing and, and how you can help your neighbors um, immediately. So many of you know we just opened uh, by Holy Cross Cemetery across from Malloy's a Veterans Village. And the Veterans Village um, serves about 66, 66 veterans. It ranges from the spectrum, uh, from those who uh, may be having um, issues um, uh, from PTSD and, and, another, and other issues, and some just living, um, they all live independently, but there's actually the VA on site to provide various services. Uh, but one of the issues that they're having and if you have a network of folks that can help, what we've tried to help is the issue of um, food. And so groceries, uh, if there are any organizations that you know um, that can provide direct meals um, to them, um, that would really be helpful. But the location is really ideal. The VA provides a sort of a host of, of services. And uh, if you haven't gotten to meet your neighbors, they're really, really uh, lovely people. And so that's one of the things. Many of you know the other issue we continue to work on and probably the most relevant issue, not to say that um, housing is not, because housing and health go together, 
uh, but it's really trying to make sure what we can do to save Seton Hospital. And so I hosted a town hall meeting uh, last week. We had about 250 uh, people who attended. And so that hospital, as you know, there was an identified buyer. And then that buyer wanted to buy four hospitals and ended up pulling out. And so the county continues to work. Um, as you know, we've given the hospital about $60 million, uh, $5 million left uh, for the seismic. Um, I had indicated um, in the San Francisco Chronicle last Sunday um, that the county um, should look at acquiring the hospital. So that is sort of out there. So we'll see how that materializes. To be quite frank with you, there's five board of supervisor uh, members. Um, the county right now faces in health because of the, the federal government, um, state government, mostly federal government, um, a deficit of about $64 million. And so uh, one of the ideas being paired uh, is pairing our workforce. So these are some of the things that we're dealing with. Health is not, um, it's not inexpensive, but at the same time, it's everyone has a right to health care. And so I want to talk to you a little bit and just close with this. My office is dealing with the census right now. I'm the chairman of the census in San Mateo County. And so we've gone and we've talked with different organizations from nonprofits uh, to churches, uh, to synagogues, to temples, whatever you can imagine. So my ask for you today is one, make sure uh, when you get this information from census that you fill it out right away. And if there are friends that you know who may need um, help or advice, it's really important um, that we do that. So what's at stake? We talked a little bit of housing, we talked a little about social services. If one person in San Mateo County does not receive or does not apply for census, we lose, um, counties and cities lose about $10,000. If 1% of the county does not, um, you know, they does not count for census, that comes up to $75 million. And so the reason that's important is so we can, we can be able to access roads. Obviously, you know, the other important reason is political representation, um, Congress, um, losing, not losing seats that obviously we, you know, we have through population that um, are very, very critical and important. And so these are some of the things we continue to work on. Um, I think Tony on my staff has uh, has flyers. Tony, Tony, yes. do you have flyers to pass yes. out for census? Um, some informa information. Information. Um, we do have various nonprofits um, that are working for the county. The county's made an investment on census to about three to about three million people. Uh, about two years ago, we had a, a program that actually was in this area, actually the heart of the county area is, you know where Villa Street is over here? Mm -hmm. That's a very, it's been identified as a very, very hard area to count. So the county went, went out really early uh, to make sure that we we're reaching out to folks and explaining uh, what census um, is. And so that's what I have. Um, at this time, if you feel free, if you want to ask some questions, um, I'll take a couple questions. If not, I want to wish you um, a happy Sunday. Um, my card, and I want to thank Bob and Melanie, my card is on the vending machine back there. So they enlarged it, they made it bigger. Feel free to call our office. Um, probably the most calls that we get are around people who need employment, uh, people who need health care, and uh, people who need housing. And so uh, Tony's on my staff, and if there's anything we can do to be accessible here for you, okay? David. Yes. I got I got David, I helped to campaign with David to keep Seton open years ago. And I'm sure glad I did because last year Seton saved my life. Great. Thank you so much, Bob. It saved, you know, it saved a lot of lives, a lot of lives. And it's great to hear that your life was saved. My grandmother was there about three weeks ago. Many of you old timers, I consider myself an old timer. It was Mary's help. I was actually born there. So um, are there any additional questions? Look, I want to wish you a happy Sunday and good luck to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kanepa.
Your words are always encouraging to all of us. Um, now we have the next speaker, um, Kim. I don't know if you're ready. Um, or somebody else looking for you. Sure. Okay. This is one of the attorneys that's working on the club, and I encourage you. Ask him if you have doubts, questions, concerns. This is the time to clear it up. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. I'm gonna take this out of here. Uh, so we're gonna switch the agenda just a little bit because uh, Kim got a little delayed by traffic coming over here. She's got to get this set up. So I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about some of the. Uh, some of the recent developments that the, that the FRAC has been working on and some of the progress that they've made in the organizational structure for the co-op. Um, and to do that, I'm going to back up just a little bit and give you some background, a little more uh, sort of overview of what's involved with that. Because one of the things that makes a co-op successful, is essential to co-op success, is to have the membership involved in the governance of the co-op. And that's one of the things that makes the co-op different than any other kind of an organization uh, where someone else runs it, like the situation you have in the park here, where someone else owns it, someone else runs it, someone else makes the decisions, someone else makes the rules. But the co-op, the members own it, the members run it, and the members make the decisions through the people that they elect to the Board of Directors. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what that looks like and what sort of progress the FRAC has made on that. And um, I just want to congratulate the, the co-op committee and all the volunteers who have been working hard since uh, the last time I came out to a resident meeting. There have been more sign-ups. Um, we're getting closer to the number that we need in order to make the co-op uh, a, a reality. You know, it, it, from a legal perspective, and that's one of the things Supervisor Kanapa was talking about, was uh, you know, we're, we're here, uh, I represent the, the, the Franciscan Resident Advisory Committee with my firm, Cole Farm and Lippman, and we do uh, work with co-ops at the formation stage, conversion, operation, governance. So from a legal perspective, despite all of this information that you may be hearing or seeing out in the community here, it is possible to do this. There's no legal barrier to making this co-op happen. And we're working through each of the issues that we have to work through in the regular course of making the co-op become a reality. So, uh, you know, if you're not sure what's going on with the co-op yes and co-op no, uh, as I understand the co-op no, their big uh, push has been it can't happen. Well, that's just not true. Uh, it's up to it's up to the residents. The residents can make it happen from a legal perspective. This is the kind of project that our firm has been involved in before, and it's you know it's it's, it's work that we do and it's work that we're doing for the FRAC for the residents of, of the park. And frankly, we're really honored to be doing it. Um, you know, for me. I have a, a background in, in cooperatives. I've been involved with cooperatives for 30 years, uh, both at the, as a member of various types of co-ops and as a lawyer. I've also worked uh, at the governance level with different kinds of co-ops. Um, so this, this is a, a, a fabulous opportunity that people have here in the park to take it uh, into their own ownership and to be able to run it and to be able to operate it. Uh, our firm is really pleased to be a part of that. We've been working with the FRAC now um, since I think it was the fall of 2018 when we first started working with the group. So um, since that time, uh, we've come a long way. And uh, some of the milestones that we've achieved uh, have been around what the co-op is going to look like when it's organized. And most recently, the FRAC has been working through a a bylaws committee to uh, work on uh, a set of bylaws for the co-op when it's formed. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in detail. 
um, in a second, but I want to back up again uh, and, and just kind of give you a big picture from a legal perspective how an organization like a co-op works because it's really important to understand, uh, you know, if you're going to be a member of a co-op, that you understand how it works. So, um, pardon me, if, if, you know, give me a high sign or nod off or something if I get a little too legal easy on you. Um, and I'll try and, and back up and make it more plain language. Uh, but I think I think you all will understand sort of what the, the structure is because um, you know it's, it's fairly simple once you hear the terms and you get familiar with them and you understand kind of the process of how it works. So. Um, in, in the world of law, uh, the first thing that you have to understand is that there are statutes out there. There are laws on the books of the state of California that are the law of California. Those are the law of the land. So all of what we're doing here with the co-op takes place under the umbrella of California statutes. So at the top level, there are statutes. There are laws that govern how co-ops work. Underneath that, then there are regulations that the state of California, the Department of Real Estate, um, puts out that they publish that also have the effect of laws. So they work like laws, but they're underneath the statutes. You've got statutes, you've got regulations. Um, the California statutes say that you can organize a co-op. So there is authority under state law to organize a co-op. And the way that you organize a co-op is set out in the California statutes. And the way that you do that is you have to have articles of incorporation. Uh, and those are the documents that form the co-op. Now here, in this case, uh, because we have an existing nonprofit resident organization, the Franciscan Resident Advisory Committee, or the FRAC, we already have articles of incorporation for a nonprofit under the statutes of California. And it's that FRAC, that nonprofit, that's going to be the co-op. So in order to form the FRAC, they had to, when they formed it, they filed articles of incorporation with the state of California. That's what gave the FRAC its legal existence. You might have heard a few years back when uh, at the Supreme Court level, they were talking about how corporations have free speech rights because they're people too. Uh, you know, entities do have to be formed, and once they're formed, they have certain rights under law, and the FRAC was formed by filing articles of incorporation. So it's a thing. It's there. It's here. And that's the organization that we're working to convert into a co-op. So once you've filed your articles of incorporation, the statutes, then the next thing that you have to do is you have to work out your bylaws. And, uh, well, let me back up, because with co-ops, uh, in particular the kind of co-op that we're forming here, there's another document that uh, is called a declaration. And a declaration is just a document that declares something. That's all it is. That's why they call it a declaration, is because it declares something. And the declaration is filed in the San Mateo County real estate records, just like a deed or a mortgage uh, or um, any, anything that gets filed in real estate records. So the declaration sets forth uh, some of the basic ideas about how this co-op is organized. Uh, it mirrors some of what's in the Articles of Incorporation and it also mirrors some of what's in the bylaws, which are the piece that, that come next. And the bylaws are really important uh, because the bylaws are the documents that kind of take the basic idea of this co-op and write down how it's going to work. And in order to put bylaws together, you have to have a lot of detail and you have to know, uh, you know what you want it to look like when it's in operation. You know, when the co-op is up and running, you're going to need to have basically a playbook look at, you know, how does the co-op work, who gets to be a member, how do, how do memberships get transferred, who gets to run it, how are officers of the co-op elected, how are the board of directors elected, what are my rights as a member, how are the, the, 
the charges for participating going to be set. All of that detail is going to go into the bylaws of the organization. And one of the milestones that the FRAC has hit recently is they've got a set of bylaws that they've been working on. That they've been, that my firm prepared a draft so that the group would have uh, a basic set of bylaws that would be uh, compliant with state law so that they could take that basic set of bylaws and then say, how do we want this co-op to work? So the FRAC formed a bylaws committee and there have been a number of volunteers who have been putting their time into reviewing that and commenting on it and so there's some back and forth because you know we have to have some dialogue about um, okay this is what the law requires, this is what you can do, this is where you've got some flexibility. So the bylaws committee has now um, given my firm their comments back on those bylaws and we're going to have another conversation about yes we could do this, you know, maybe we could do that, you know, we have to go through these different comments and suggestions and tailor it both to how the co-op wants to run itself and also how to make sure it's going to be uh, in compliance with the law. So um, the bylaws is a very important piece of this whole picture because that's what's going to run the co-op, that's what's going to govern the rights and the obligations of the members of the co-op. So um, we've talked about it a little bit before at previous resident meetings and if you're interested um, in learning a little bit more about the bylaws or the bylaws process, I do have a couple of handouts. Um, so you can either see me after the meeting or I'll put, put them back on the table back there. Um, one of the handouts just is, is kind of a, a, a real basic outline of what I talked about. Uh, saying, you know, an overview of the governing law, basically statutes, regulations, articles, declarations, bylaws. And then underneath the bylaws are the operating rules of the park. So right now, if you go on the Franciscans website, you can look at the park rules and you can see, like, you can't park here and you can't do this. And, you know, you, you have to have your dog on a leash. I don't know what all the rules are. But that's that level of detail of how people behave themselves in the park is going to be governed by a set of rules. And now that the bylaws committee has given Gold Farm and Lipton suggestions on what they want to be in the bylaws, now the bylaws committee is looking at the park rules. Um, so these are two very important pieces of this process and there's significant progress that's been made on that so far. So it's, I, I think, you know, kudos to all the volunteers who have been working on that. Um, it's a lot of work and, you know, you really have to think about, you know, the needs of everybody in the park. You know, this is not a process where one person gets to decide what's best for them. Um, it's a process where people get to decide what's best for everyone. And in the bylaws also is a framework for how to resolve conflict as well. So, you know, conflict happens. It's inevitable. And, you know, when you live with other human beings in a community, you're going to have conflict. And we know this uh, both from, you know, our own personal experience and from looking around. And so in the governing documents of the co-op, there's going to be a process for this. And I, I'm looking over at Kim, I apologize if I'm covering anything that you're going to be talking about. I'm not sure. Um, so, you know, with some of this stuff, um, it's good even to hear it repeated times. So, you know, once you get more familiar with the terminology and the structure, it starts to make more sense. I think then you can feel more comfortable engaging in the process, which is really critical to the success of, of, of a co-op. Um, so let me stop there for just a minute and see if anybody has questions about bylaws. Yeah. Can you make a distinction between the board of directors and the officers as well Okay, yeah, good, good question. So the question is, what's the difference between officers and directors uh, of the co-op? So uh, a cooperative is governed by a board of directors, and the board of directors is elected by the members. So once the board has been elected, uh, and, and here I think the option that uh, the 
the bylaws committee is recommending is a, a seven member board. So it'll be seven people on the board, which I think is a good number because you get an, enough people that you've got some diversity of opinions and um, people to do the lifting of the work of the board, but it's not too big to make it unworkable. Um, you, know, you can still actually schedule a meeting where everyone can attend. Uh, which is important. So the, the board is elected by the members, and once the board is elected, the board then has to select among itself who is going to be the president of the board, who is going to be the secretary of the board, and who is going to be the treasurer of the board. And so the bylaws set forth for the directors what that process looks like. How are the officers selected? How long they get to serve? Uh, what are the, the responsibilities, but basically the, the president of the board, these three different officers that are pretty typical, and, and you can create other kinds if you think it's appropriate. So these three officers, the president, the secretary, and the treasurer, the president basically is the chair. So they, they're responsible for making sure that the meetings happen and that everybody participates and that the business of the, of the co-op gets done. And all, the, all the directors have that responsibility as do the members, but the president, you know, it's really their responsibility for making sure that everybody focuses and stays on task and, and that the business does happen. The secretary is responsible for record keeping, so all of the minutes of the board, all of the official actions of the co-op, the historical record, uh, that's what the secretary is responsible for. Uh, and a lot of times in a larger organization, those responsibilities can be delegated out to uh, staff, like for example, a management company oftentimes performs a lot of the duties that the secretary is responsible for, but the secretary needs to make sure that the management company is doing its job. Um, the last officer is the treasurer, same sort of a thing, the treasurer is responsible for the financial health of the co-op. Well, not for the health itself, but for the financial governance of the co-op and making sure that the, the financial reports are done, that they're done properly, that they're done timely, that they're available to the membership when they're supposed to be available. Um, and so, again, like with the secretary, that is oftentimes something that the treasurer or delegates to the management company who is responsible for all the financial stuff. But, so, Big picture, you've got the members, the members elect the board to govern the co-op, and the board selects officers who run the board. And how long is the term? That, that's flexible. So the terms, how, how long are the terms of the board and the officers? Because those are those can be two different things. Um, the, Co-op does have some flexibility, but it's typical to have a two-year term or a three-year term for a board member. There could be a learning curve in working on a board, and so you want to make sure that people have enough time to figure out how things actually operate. But you don't want it to be too long because you need turnover in that. You, know, you need fresh ideas. You need to not burn out your, your volunteers. Uh, so. Two to three years is pretty typical for a board member. Um, and for an officer, typically those are selected each year at the board at the time of the board election. So that way you get some um, you know, turnover there too. And you can't you don't always know who's going to be on the board after an election. And elections happen every year. And typically you stagger the terms for your board members so that you always have some people who've been on the board for a little while and some new members so that you don't get caught in a situation where the whole board is suddenly new and nobody knows what's going on. Jeff, I have a question. Yes. Um, for the people that don't sign up, they go up and they remain a renter. Are they going to have any say in terms of how the park is going to be run? So the, the question is, for those people who don't join as members of the co-op and who just remain as a renter. So um, what rights do they have in terms of the governance of the organization? Are they going to be able to have a say in what happens in the park? 
uh, from a legal perspective, they don't have any right to participate in the governance of the organization. Uh, now, you could have policies that, you know, obviously you don't want to ignore a good idea. And so if there's a renter that comes to you and says, hey, I have this idea for a way to make the park great, and this is all you have to do, you know, you don't, you're not obligated to ignore that. Uh, but that's one of the main differences between being a member of the co-op and being remaining a renter, is that if you're a member of the co-op, you get the vote, a renter does not. You get a say, a legal say, in how the organization is run. You can yourself run for the board of directors. You can be a director, you can be an officer. Uh, a renter cannot. Any other questions, either about bylaws generally or, or sort of the, the legal structure of how this is going to work? Can we exclude uh, non members from any of the meetings, or is it advisable to always have a proposal to non members? So the, the question is can we exclude non members from? Uh, member meetings. Uh, it, it's up to the co-op to decide whether you would want to, but I, I think that's fairly typical is that it's the members who are the ones who have that right. And the members are the ones that get to go to the meetings, the members get to vote, uh, the renters do not, they're just, just renters. Shelley. Can you um, discuss the difference between uh, changing the bylaws versus changing the bar rules? Sure. So the, the question is, the, you know, what's the difference between changing the bylaws and changing the park rules? So uh, the park rules are, you know, once they're agreed upon, they will be, or once the, once the, the way it is right now, because the co-op is in its formation stage, uh, they can't really adopt the rules yet, um, but the bylaws committee is putting the rules together. So when the co-op is formed, the rules will be put out to the residents, to the members, I'm sorry, the members, and the members will have an opportunity to comment on those rules. And the board then can make changes to the rules based on the comments, if that's necessary or if it makes sense to do. And then after that comment and review period is over, the board then votes to adopt or reject even the rules. But once the rules are agreed on, the membership still has an opportunity if there's a, if, if there's a, a rule that slipped by, say maybe nobody was paying attention or somebody uh, devious on the board decided they wanted a rule that you know, they got their own designated parking space and the best space in the park or you know something truly obnoxious like that the membership can veto a rule even after it's been adopted by voting so there's a process built in whereby you know the there's notice, there's transparency, there's an opportunity to comment, and there's a safety valve at the end through the power of the membership if a rule gets by that's not a good rule. And if the membership decides to vote against a rule that was adopted by the board, the board then is prohibited from re-proposing that rule for another 12 months. So the law says, you know, if the members say no, you can't just come back and do it again. You gotta wait this extra 12 month period. So that's how the, the rules work, and that's how rules get changed too. Um, if somebody wants to change a rule, they go to the board and say, I'd like to see a rule about this. And then there's discussion at the board level, notice, comment, adoption, and the, and the safety valve is there. The bylaws, the process for changing or amending the bylaws is set forth in the bylaws themselves. And what the bylaws, I think, here are going to say, and somebody who's on the bylaws committee can tell me what the most current thinking is, but normally in order to change the bylaws, which are the governing rules of the organization, 
you need to have a high threshold of people who want that to happen because you don't want people tinkering. With, you don't want the bylaws to say one thing one year and something different the next year. You know, you don't want that kind of fluidity in your bylaws. You need predictability. Those rules have to be pretty stable. You need to know how things work for the foreseeable future. So typically with the bylaws, you're going to need a two-thirds majority of the members who vote to change the bylaws. And there are certain things, certain actions, and the bylaws can say this too, certain actions can require even more people voting in order to approve them. They can say, you know, you can put in the bylaws, we need unanimous approval from the members who are voting in order to close the clubhouse, for example. Or if you wanted an even higher threshold for change, you could say, we need unanimous vote of all of the members, not just all of the you could voter, the voting members, you know, not just everybody who voted, but everybody. So there's different ways to kind of structure uh, how changes and amendments to some of those documents work, um, and there's some flexibility. Fascinating stuff. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> it's hard work. But has anybody ever um, served on a board of directors before? If you have, raise your hand. Okay, so we've got a couple of people. So that, you know, if you if you've ever done it before, you learn a lot doing it, um, and it's a it's a real opportunity that regular people oftentimes don't have. I was very involved in. Um, credit unions for a number of years. If, if you know anything about credit unions, credit unions are cooperatives. They're financial cooperatives, they're banks, but they're cooperatives. And I was elected to the board of my credit union when I was 31 years old, so you know, pretty young. And I never would have had an opportunity to be a director of a financial institution at the age of 31 if I hadn't been born wealthy into money, you know, didn't have family connections, but because it was a co-op, I was able to, and I was a member, I was able to run for the board, people could look at my qualifications and say, this person might be good, we're gonna vote that person in, see how that person does on the board. And I served on the board for 12 years, and it was a fabulous experience. I learned a tremendous amount about decision-making, about democracy, about uh, governance, about business, um, you know, this is an opportunity for, for people in your community to build their capacity, which when you can do it at this level, you can also do it at higher levels. You, you find, you know, I, find, I found after getting those kinds of skills, I was more involved in local politics, state politics, national politics, and I found myself lobbying the Congress people in Washington. <laughs> you know, just, whoops, just by getting elected to the board of my call. So. Has anybody, um, let's see, uh, has anybody ever been a member of a co-op or is a member of a co-op right now? Are you, do you bank at a credit union? You have a credit union? So you are a member of a co-op. Anybody ever shop at REI? <laughs> REI is a There, there are a lot of, you know, there's, there's a lot of co-ops out there in the world that maybe you've come across or participated in and weren't even aware of. Any other questions? Take a look at the time. So, how are you? Excuse me. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. But somebody left their phone on the table. And someone's been trying to call. And they won't give their name, and it's sort of an urgent thing. Does anyone recognize this? Did they the that phone is voicing from here? They found it somewhere up the street. Oh, it was on the table. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. I apologize. I thought it was on in here. Okay. It might be supervisor for that. <laughs> God, I hope not. <laughs> Sorry. Well, we don't want this phone calls. <laughs> So the, the, uh, let me just, the last couple of things that Shelly asked me to talk about were um, 
just sort of where we were in terms of forming um, the co-op. And I, I mentioned that we've got the bylaws working, the rules are in progress. Um, Karen, my partner at Bill Farb and Lemon and I, Karen's not here, um, her mother is celebrating her 90th birthday today, so I guess oh, wow. we'll give her a pass today. Um, but Karen and I are working with the lender, with the National Co-op Bank, to sort of fix what the approval process looks like so that we can get started on the due diligence that has to take place for the loan to be made. So that, you know, that communication, that interaction is happening. And we are also working closely with um, Shelly and the other volunteers to um, map out how the other state law requirements, the county requirements, and the city requirements are going to be met. Um, again, Goldfarb and Lipman, uh, has done this sort of thing before, and we are um, happy to be doing it again and happy to be doing it uh, with the FRAC. And we wish you the, the best of luck. Um, talk to your neighbors, tell them about the co op. It, it, it can happen if people want it to happen. So, uh, thank you. Jeff, that was really encouraging, especially for a lot of people that still have doubts that the co-op can happen. I'm glad you can hear it from someone that doesn't live in the park, um, especially someone that knows the law. Because these processes, these entities, require people like Jeff that can do it legally, and legally our co-op can move forward. It is very important that all of you that are here can spread the message to the rest of the community that this is a legal process that we can do. There is no an impediment to this legal process, even though some people might say otherwise. We don't see any of their attorneys up here telling you that that cannot happen. On the other hand, we have attorneys that work on your behalf telling you, yes, it can happen. So, one of the objectives today is for you to spread the message to the rest of the community that yes, you heard it from attorneys that the co-op can really move forward. And we are actually getting close. Um, Jeff is in conversations with the bank and the bank um, might move forward very soon. We have the legal path covered with Shelley to complete this process. The next step is some of you have to sign those documents. And remember, we have a new program now in which no money is required. You have to put no money down. If we don't close the deal on the co-op, all you do is waste a signature and a piece of paper. If we actually close the deal and deliver the ownership of the park to you, then you pay your membership and you pay it as you want. There is no limit in terms of how much money you can pay into your membership. If you want to pay a dollar a month, it's up to you. We don't have a legal requirement in the membership that requires you to pay a certain amount. So it is up to you to decide what that amount would be. It is unheard of that a community like us can take the ownership of the park by signing a piece of document. And I'm sure Jeff, with his experience, can tell you that this is a very, very unique opportunity that we have at the park. And it has been the work of Shelley for over 10 years to create this path for you. Shelly doesn't live here, but she's been working very, very hard to protect your homes. The fact that your home is still here, especially in the Bay Area with this environment, is a proof that things can be done. And she has worked tirelessly, even on Sundays, to protect your home. She does it every single day. 
And I think you need to realize that, that her legal work is protecting your home as we speak. There are many, many mobile home parks around the Bay Area that are closed in general. If you don't believe me, Google it. Google it. How many mobile home parks are closing down? It is an alarming rate. And we have the opportunity to take the complete ownership of the park by signing a membership that requires no money down. So the job for you guys is to spread the message. And Kim will tell us the benefits of the co-op. Thank you. 
Yes. We all talk about what could happen. We're sitting on a gold mine. Okay. And this gold mine might be sold right underneath us anytime. We won't be able to say anything about it. And our homes are going to be gone. Okay, so that, this group was pretty, um, didn't have any big questions, but the biggest concern is that this is a, a great piece of property, and without a co-op, you won't really know whether you can actually keep it or not. Yeah, and so, so we talked about so, all the homeowners that are closing. Okay. And, and get redeveloped. Good, just a lot of uncertainty. Yeah. All right, and so this group right here, I know that you, you need to be doing some um, interpreting here, but um, were there <coughs> questions or things that were unclear that came up in this group? <laughs> anybody, can anybody share? Can you share anything that came up? Okay, okay, we'll come back to this group. How about the group in the back here? Um, Okay, let's all listen. We're still in listening mode. Were there questions that came up? Okay. Any big, the big things that came up that were either things you're excited about, things you're worried about? Or we discussed what if we get co-op and what if we get to the opportunity to take place. And then we, um, and then we all discussed what if we do get co-op and everything that we said, we made a comment about what our vision is. Okay, so this group had, again, not too many questions, seemed pretty clear, but um, we're really pretty positive about, about what their expectations were for the co-op. Okay, so how about right here, in your group, what the other small group? <laughs> this group is pretty on board, they seem to know pretty much what would happen if we did not have a co-op, what will happen if we do have a co-op. So they were an easily managed group because they were all pretty educated and savvy on the co-op issues here. My question was, when will I have to uh, be paying the balance of my money? One of our ladies put down $500 uh, to start with the buying into the membership for the co-op, and she wants to know when will she be able to uh, be required to continue and pay off that balance. So I'm going to defer that full answer to one of our attorneys who will be able to speak to that properly. I don't want to get mixed up and say the wrong thing. We're going to get to the questions uh, in a little while. Okay, is this group ready? <coughs> So this concerns about misunderstanding better than one. Okay, and what the misunderstanding about when the balance of the money? We're trying to find one person other than one. Okay. So we'll just put one more time. Okay, alright, we'll go to this group over here. Yeah, our group was um, uh, kind of divided. Um, some don't really understand all the benefits of the co-op. And what would happen if it goes to the co-op? And if it goes to the other entity, if it was a reassessment, like the land, they have to die that effect. Um, but we're, we're in a discussion of um, most of the group is already in the co-op. Um, but there were some questions about the benefits of the co-op and why we want to help them. Um, so if the reassessment, was that if it is a co-op or if it isn't a co-op? Yeah, well, if, if there's a reassessment value of the land, uh, if there's co-op, personal no co-op. When was the, uh, the land going to be reassessed? Property taxes. Property taxes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Hopefully yeah. never. All right, um, so this group. So there's concerns here about the same thing about prices increasing with, this, with assessments, and I'm trying to find out our official translator. Okay, all right. Okay, so.
So I think we've heard from each group. What I want to do right now is just kind of go back to a couple of slides that kind of cover some of the major um, aspects of co-op. And then we'll also get, uh, if there's a quick answer to these questions, Jeff, do you have answer, uh, answers to these you want to come up and just share? Signed up and you didn't pay the full amount when you signed the positive payment. When does the rest of it do? Hi, thank you. Um, so, when is the balance due if you didn't put the full $2,500 down? That's up to the co op as to how that needs to get paid back. So, the, the group would decide uh, what, the, what the repayment schedule would be for. Uh, for making that payment. Uh, if, what if there's a land reassessment? So I, I think if I'm understanding that question correctly, it's when is the land going? Would it be reassessed? I think the question was uh, if, if the owners of the park goes to the co-op is going to be a reassessment that was the land or goes to a different entity. Where, where is that reassessment happening? Right. Okay. So, um, if the land goes to the co-op, will there be a reassessment? And the answer to that is no. That's one of the benefits to, to forming a co-op is that you then would qualify for an exception from reassessment on transfer. So uh, if the land transfers to any other entity, nonprofit or otherwise, if it's not a co-op, it doesn't meet the exceptions, it doesn't meet the requirements for the exception that we're trying to do for the FRAC, then the land would be reassessed on the property tax basis. Okay, I'm just going to wrap this up just with a summary of what we've done in the past. I know it's a Sunday afternoon, people will want to get home, and then after I finish, I just like you to, um, Shelly just has a few things that she can um, share with you, so I want to not keep you too long. So um, just uh, the over, some overview things about um, a co-op. One is that how does a co-op compare to other forms of housing? Basically, um, uh, condominium, which, uh, uh, is uh, one option that people can go to. But in a, in a condominium, each person owns their own land. That's not really possible here. So, um, But if you're comparing it, in a housing co-op, um, all of the people together would own all of this land. And you would each own your individual or rent your individual uh, manufactured home. In a rental, um, you don't own anything. So that's the biggest difference is if we look at a piece of pie, um, you get none of the pie if you are not a co-op. Um, so some of the things that are just kind of a summary of a difference between a co-op and, and not having a co-op is a co-op is operating at cost. So the purpose of the co-op is not to make money, it's to provide housing to the members at the lowest price possible. That's, that's the whole thing. Um, it gives people a direct voice in what happens with their community. Um, there's a strong incentive for people to invest in the property. If you own it, you're much more likely to feel like it's yours. You're much more likely to take care of things. So that's what the research shows anyway. Um, there's a potential for a year, even though this is um, slated to be a limited equity housing co-op, there is a chance for some equity accumulation. So you, you could sell your, your unit and um, and get um, some a profit from it, um, but it would be limited, and um, you don't have a risk of displacement because it, it especially for a limited equity housing co-op you cannot sell this. If you decide if the if somebody decided it would be really cool to sell this property, you would have to sell it to a nonprofit. So the limited equity model is pretty clear on on uh, security. Um, if you don't, um, if you if you do not, if it's not a co-op, um, you will have um, rent increases. That doesn't mean that you wouldn't have in, um, increasing in, increases in the co-op. They will just go proportional to whatever the costs are. 
Um, there's no direct voice in policies if you are not a co-op. Um, you don't necessarily have as much incentive. I mean, you've got beautiful property here with a wonderful community room and pool, and most people are going to take care of whatever um, property they have and be respectful, but sometimes people have, don't have as much of an incentive if they don't have an ownership stake. Um, there's, uh, there's no land ownership at all in, um, if you're not a co-op, and the, the homes probably are more likely to go down in price. Your rents go up, but the value can go down. And um, there's that risk of displacement that I think is the biggest thing um, to people. So basically, um, there's a lot more um, self-determination with a co-op. Um, not being a co-op does place a lot of vulnerability because all those decisions are not up to the people in the co-op. They're to whoever is, owns this property. Um, so one of the things that um, it, and I'm not, I know that I um, work for a nonprofit, we're pro co-op, I, I have to, you know, disclose that, but these things are also just realities in, of, of everyday life, which is, um, what's the difference between um, the inherent conflicts between owners and between, um, between um, you know, if you're a renter? versus being an owner. Now, remember that the owner focus of any property is on what works best for the owner. If the owner are the residents and the co-op, the focus is on what's good, what, what people democratically agree is the best thing. Um, rent increases, um, this is another inherent conflict. If you're a co-op, what is your perspective going to be on a, any kind of uh, rent increase? If you're an owner, what is, uh, and you're uh, an owner um, outside of the co-op, what is your, what's your perspective? Just think about that. Probably I would imagine that the perspective of residents would always be, wow, I want to keep those rents as low as possible. Or, yeah, it really would be nice to really redo the community room. Maybe I'll vote for a rent increase so that we can redo this or we can have some kind of um, property increase versus um, maybe um, a, an outside owner that says, gosh, you know, I, I'm not getting enough from, from this property right now. I'd like to raise the rent because I want more profit. Um, maintenance costs. Again, um, you, your board of directors, if you're a co-op, are going to be looking at the maintenance. They're going to be um, looking at financial statements and deciding, is the maintenance up to our standards? It, are they up to the standards of what our residents want? Um, and we, maybe you would want more things taken care of um, in the maintenance. Maybe you don't agree with the maintenance company that you have. You have a voice in that if you're a co-op. If you're not a co-op, the maintenance, the perspective of the maintenance is by whoever owns the, the property. They'll decide what's adequate maintenance and what isn't adequate maintenance and how much to pay and how much not to pay. Uh, the services, whatever services are offered, again, the perspective is quite different. If you're a co-op, the services that are offered by the co-op are going to be determined by residents, and the perspective is going to be what's good for everybody that lives here. If you're thinking about services from a perspective of someone who is an, um, an outside owner of the park, you're going to be thinking, well, services cost a lot. I want to keep them as minimal as possible. Again, the rules and the policies that Jeff just went over a little while ago, the rules really are determined by the, by the community. And sometimes, usually bylaws have initiatives, and you can override the board, or you can have an initiative that you really feel positive about. If you don't think the board is acting on, you can have an initiative. I've um, worked with communities where they've had initiatives for all kinds of things, and sometimes kind of bizarre things, like um, one community I work with, it was against the rules for kids to ride skateboards. It was a huge thing. It was very divisive in the community. And um, the community decided, the board decided, well, this is something that we want to have an election about. We want people to vote. Should we let the kids have skateboards in the park or not? And that was an open discussion. And the kids, they had a big forum. And the kids spoke and so forth. So that was up to people in the community. Of course, first they looked at the law. And the law is actually that skateboarding is dangerous anyway. So there's probably not a lot of liability for a kid getting hurt when they're skateboarding the property. So that's the perspective that happens. 
And again, the last one is if a park is going to close or there's, uh, it's, there's going to be a sale. What a, that's a huge difference between an outside owner and someone who is a resident of the park. And if, if you're a limited equity housing co-op, you actually have that choice taken away from you because we want it to remain affordable and we want it to be, be around for other people when they want to move in later on. I'm just going to do one more slide and then um, I'll turn it over to Shelly and she can fill you up on, uh, fill you in on what's happening. So basically, just to, these are just the general things about a co-op is that it operates at cost, that um, it stabilizes um, expenses over the long run. You can have a long-term plan of what you want to do and so forth as owners. Um, it secures the value of your home because we're going to make everyone's going to make sure this property is well taken care of. So when you go to sell, your property will get the most money that it can because everybody, it's everyone's interest that things look good. Um, it also makes your home easier to sell. Usually there's a process that the co-op has. The, um, the co-op um, usually has um, an incentive to, to sell, but also um, there's usually some criteria that people have to have when they, uh, when they sell their, their property. There, there usually is some kind of um, process under which people are interviewed so that they know it's a co-op when they get in, and so, so they're on board with all those kinds of things. And writing the committee, that um, involves, and really it protects your park from uh, closure and being changed to another purpose. So those are just kind of the major things that a co-op does, and um, it, I just wanted to also say that um, this process, you know, this is going to, you're going to come to a decision here within the next several months. So um, if you have any questions, you have lots of resources. Um, our nonprofit is on the website. I think our, um, I'm happy to give you my business card. Um, we're happy to, I mean, we see having a relationship with your park in the long term. So we can help you to make decisions, help you to know what the rules are, how to best govern, and so forth. So um, I, and I hope I can I'll come out and see you again sometime. And if there's things that you'd like me to cover, I'm happy to do that too. Shelly? Okay, so Shelly's asking, what about financial reports? Can anybody look at the financial reports and how much transparency is there? I can say that um, usually there's a, every co-op has an annual meeting, and at that annual meeting, there usually is a financial statement that's shared with everyone. There's a budget for the next year that's usually shared with everyone. Um, in terms of the, um, being able to have financial statements at any time, that's up to the board of directors. I encourage people to have a lot of transparency. Um, financial statements are, should be given monthly to the board of directors. The board of directors should cover those. It's usually a good idea to have open meetings. People can come to board meetings, but they are listening at board meetings. Usually board meetings have a time for member comment, and then the board has to do their business. And so um, they usually, after the member comment, the board meeting will, will take place, and people, uh, members are usually very welcome to listen in on those meetings. And that would include uh, looking at those financial statements. So um, usually there's a lot of transparency. I have a question. Um, with your experience, um, many years you do develop co-op, do you have an example of a co-op that has done the opposite in her residents versus helping them? Is, have you seen that in your experience? Well, the only thing that I have seen is sometimes um, if, if there's people are not minding their board of directors, there are very rare occasions where a board member might um, not not do what they're supposed to do. The law says that board members must put the interests of the co-op first. That is the law. It's not just that they should do it. And so there have been cases where boards are not very well educated and a board member will go amok. That's usually when they call us is when they've gone amok. And it's very, very rare, but that does happen. And actually, we've called in the, um, the state attorney general because that board member broke the law. So there are lots of ways that you can enforce when you when you have that. The important thing is for people to vote and people to pay attention and people come to meetings. 
and so forth in a, in a book because that's the way you get what you want from your community is by being active. Any other questions? Oh, thank you. Shelly, you want to give a little update on what's happening? Thank you. That was very informative. Um, and we appreciate that you traveled all the way from Davis to come in and uh, visit us on a Sunday afternoon. So basically, uh, I just would like to uh, expand upon what Jeff had, had mentioned earlier this afternoon is that yes, we can. We can become a co-op. You can become a co-op. Um, the signs are out there, but the signs are wrong. We're 10 years into this process of becoming, actually it's longer than that because the prior boards from the 90s tried to set up a resident on the park. Um, they brought in a nonprofit housing sponsor and there was a bond issue and you all know the history. Um, <clears throat> so right now we're at, you're at a crossroads. Uh, there's a transfer that's going to have to happen. It'll either be to FHC or to FRAC. If it transfers to FRAC, as you know, you can become a resident-owned park. 100% of the board positions will be residents. There won't be any outsiders making decisions for you. So nothing has changed from that perspective. We did have to go to court to get an extension of time in order to keep this opportunity available, and we were successful with that. Lake Housing is, is cooperating with us. So all we need, um, as Pedro mentioned, go out and engage with your neighbors and really explain to them how truly, truly important this is for you if you want to maintain your park as the way it is and to uh, develop it into a thriving uh, community that is not going to be subject to massive upheaval from rent increases from having the property taxes reassessed upon transfer or from having a new board that's not controlled by residents making decisions that perhaps you know mixed income housing developments might be nicer than a mobile home park. We don't know what they're thinking. We don't know what who is funding the no co-op signs out there, what influences are behind that uh, no on co-op uh, uh, noise. But it's not good for the community if you want to remain a mobile home park that's affordable. So for instance, uh, a friend of mine told me last week that they heard that Santa Rosa Park was closing last week. I, I don't know the name of the park, but Google it. I'm sure it's true. And on the 14th, on Valentine's Day, there was an article in the San Jose Mercury News about a Redwood City mobile home park closing. So this is the way of the future. These mobile home parks are sitting on prime land, which you all know. You've got beautiful views of the, the ocean, depending on where your space is. And developers are looking for land in order to develop. The best way for you to control your future as a mobile home park is to take the bull by the horns, sign up for the co-op. There's power in numbers. We can. Uh, finesse the loan, get it closed with NCB, issue the membership interest, and the next issues will be what color you want to paint the clubhouse. <laughs> so make the step, educate your neighbors, go out, meet them. If you don't know them, go knock on their door and explain to them how crucial it is for us to get the final push done so we get sufficient participation that NCB says, yes, you're really impressive, you've formed this co-op, and we want to loan you millions of dollars. So it's your job, I'm passing the wand over to you to, to do your part to make sure that all of your neighbors are fully informed.
part of the governance of this place is those clipboards back there for those committees. Please sign up and get involved. So, um, I have heard from a lot of people, a lot of residents, that they get confused, not just you, get confused by these no sign. Do they have legal backing in terms of telling residents that it's not possible, that the stipulation is not real, that um, it must go to FHC and not crap? Can you please uh, tell us a little bit of what is the real legality of all these, just no sign. What, what is, do they have any legal backing? No. So basically, Pedro uh, brought with him the class uh, notification that was mailed to all of the residents back in 2013. Um, and if you look at it, uh, Pedro put it on the back table. It says the transfer will be to FHC or to FRAC. And uh, those of you who were around at the time will remember all the details of how that came about. But the point was, was to maintain flexibility. If we were able to find some way to refinance out the bond debt and get rid of it, then we didn't need a nonprofit housing sponsor anymore because they're there because of the bond debt, municipal bond debt. It's a requirement. But once that's paid off, they don't need to be there anymore. And you, if you choose to become a 100% resident-owned park, with all of the board positions filled by residents who live here and care about this place and care about rent levels and care about maintaining the value of your home and care about paving the streets and care about all of the issues that I've heard about endlessly for the past 10 years, cutting live trees, the potholes, the sewer system, the water tank, lighting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you if you really care about all of that, you'll sign up for the co-op, sign up for committees. The committees are meeting every Thursday night. They're really a lot of fun. I, I mean, it, you know, reading bylaws is kind of fun, but, <laughs> but it, it is fun. You get to talk to your neighbors and talk about uh, issues, the rules. Um, there's new committees forming on the um, uh, property maintenance committee is going to be the start meeting on Thursday and uh, it's a fabulous opportunity for you to get involved and instead of just being able to complain about what other people are doing to you this is a chance for you to be able to make change for yourselves it's it's phenomenal it's very powerful um, the Court order said that it was going to either go to FHC or FRAC. We haven't heard anything about FHC. When was the last time that FHC even had a meeting? The last meeting of the FHC, I believe, was in October or November of 2017. Um, and, you know, I've sat in on uh, a number of FHC meetings uh, when it when it was meeting. It was an advisory committee of, at that point. But the problem with the FHC meetings is that three of the board members are from Lake Housing and one of the board members is from Daly City and then there's three members of representing the residents. So the residents are in the minority. So the residents might have an opinion about towing or parking or tree cutting but if the Daly City representative sides with Link Housing, There's you, you can't win that vote. If it transfers to FRAC and there's a vote about tree trimming or parking or anything else, the residents, it's going to be a consensus of resident opinion that's going to make the decision. And, and that's huge. So you can't understate that. Shelley, what was the percentage of the time that the city rep on the board voted with Link? I don't remember a single time where the city rep voted for the residents. Thank you. Yeah, Never. Never. Not Never. a single time. Mm -hmm. And can many of you attended those meetings too, so you know, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> mm -hmm.
So, you know, I, I can't say it enough. I mean, if this park was owned by a, a for-profit corporation, you can be pretty sure that your rents would be inching up to $2,300 a month, like the mobile home park in uh, San Jose that uh, was transferred a couple times through a big corporate entity. Uh, because mobile home parks, unfortunately, are you know now valued as you know prime investments for corporate uh, REITs and I don't know hedge funds or whatever. But the market rate in San Jose is twenty three hundred a month. So if you want to maintain your affordability here, the best way for you to go is to go co-op, and that's FRAC. Any other questions? and friends. Oh,